Hi everyone, this video is part one of the 4B series on personality for AP Psychology students. This particular video will cover the psychodynamic theory of personality. As you can see on the CED unit outline, we are in the first video of the second series of unit four, and I'm calling this section 4B. If you notice at the top of the chart, the CED refers to unit four as social psychology and personality. But if you take a look at the list of topics in this second section, you'll notice that there's two additional topics that are not necessarily personality, but are related and they are motivation and emotion. So I'll still refer to this section as personality, but I did want to point out that we are going to touch on a few other topics as well. These are the key focus questions for today's video. By the end, you should be able to answer each one of them. These are the vocabulary concepts that I will explain in today's video. By the end, you should be able to define and describe them. As you already know, a psychologist's perspective informs how they think about, study, and evaluate different psychological phenomena. And that perspective shapes the way that they view different concepts. You know that the different perspectives are evolutionary, biological, behavioral, cognitive, social, cultural, humanistic, and psychodynamic. And each of these perspectives will approach personality in different ways. So let's first start by defining personality and then I'll dive deeper into the psychodynamic approach to personality. Personality can be defined as an individual's unique and enduring patterns that make them distinguishable from others. And these patterns include things like our unique thoughts, feelings and behaviors. And in this video, we will dive into the different ways psychodynamic psychologists study and explain personality. So let's start with a little history. The psychodynamic approach began with a man named Sigmund Freud. He's not actually mentioned in the CED by name and nor are most of his theories, but his early work laid the foundation for the psychodynamic approach. So I thought it would be just a little bit easier for you to make the connection to the field if we started in the beginning. Sigmund Freud was an Austrian neurologist and the founder of psychoanalysis, which is a method of treating mental illness, by exploring the unconscious mind. And he believed that unconscious thoughts and feelings influenced our behavior and could cause psychological distress. His therapy techniques aimed at bringing out these hidden thoughts and feelings and bringing them out to the surface. He helped patients understand their emotions and behaviors and past experiences. And Freud believed that the mind was structured into three parts, the id, the ego, and the superego. And these parts, some we are aware of and some we are not. The id, he believed, is the part that developed first, and it's the part of the mind that seeks immediate pleasure and satisfaction, and it's driven by our basic needs and desires. The superego is the part of the mind that acts on a moral compass and a moral conscience. It guides us with ideals and societal rules, and it, it helps us feel guilty when we do something wrong, and it helps us feel proud when we do something right. The ego is the rational part of the mind. It's the most conscious part. It's the part that we are aware of, and it's trying to balance and um, go between the two parts of the id and the ego. And this is the present part. This is the part that's making the decisions. It's considering our desires, and it's also considering the constraints of reality. And in Freud's view, the interaction between these three parts of the mind shaped our personality and ultimately our behaviors. Sigmund Freud believed that the id, ego, and superego were elements of our personality, but they operated on different levels of conscious awareness. Many people will illustrate this using an iceberg, because when you look at an iceberg, what you're seeing above the water will look like a large towering piece of ice. But if you look below the surface, it will reveal that the iceberg is actually much larger. In fact, the park that is floating above the surface is quite small in comparison to what is underneath the water. So this demonstrates how Freud viewed the mind and how many psychodynamic psychologists view the mind. The conscious mind is the part of the mind that we are aware of. It's our ideas and our memories, our emotions. It's things that we can access freely. The preconscious is the part of our mind that's outside of our current awareness, but it could be accessible and it could be retrieved with effort. Then there's the unconscious. This, according to Freud, is the part of the mind that's difficult to access and it's hidden deep below the surface and it keeps our inner impulses and desires. 
However, psychodynamic psychologists believe that these unconscious drives, though not known or fully aware of, can influence our behaviors and our actions and even our feelings without our awareness. Now, the reason I believe the CED leaves out Sigmund Freud and a lot of his theories, but picks up with his followers is because Sigmund Freud's work has been significantly criticized for being unscientific. Many of his theories like the Oedipus and Electra complex, and even his psychosexual stages have been criticized for focusing too narrowly on childhood and sexuality. And many of his ideas are difficult to test and consequently, difficult to prove. Psychodynamic psychologists are those who draw on the ideas that Freud started with, like the unconscious processes that influence behavior, but have built upon his theories with a more evidence-based approach. While some of Freud's ideas, like the id, ego, and superego, are less emphasized today, Concepts like defense mechanisms and unconscious influences and early childhood experiences still shape modern therapy and research today. Many psychodynamic psychologists continue to draw upon the idea of the ego, particularly in understanding how people manage their emotions, maintain a stable sense of self, and cope with stress. Before moving on though, I did wanna make a quick note about some of the people you see on the screen. These are notable psychodynamic psychologists who have laid the foundation for how we think about and study the unconscious mind and unconscious elements of our personality. And the CED doesn't name them, but does bring up a lot of important elements of their research. So I wanted you to see their faces and hear their names. Carl Jung introduced the idea of introversion and extroversion and the collective unconscious. Karen Horney challenged Freud's idea ideas on gender and introduce theories of basic anxiety and the impact of childhood relationships on personality. Herman Rorschach is most notable for developing the inkblot test to explore a person's unconscious thoughts, emotions, and perceptions. Eric Erickson is someone you're probably familiar with from our previous unit. He developed the idea of psychosocial stages. Alfred Adler focused on how we can be driven by inferiority complexes and strive towards superiority. And finally, there's Anna Freud. Anna is Sigmund Freud's daughter who contributed to child psychoanalysis and advanced the study of defense mechanisms. So for the next part of the video, I will explain the psychodynamic approach to explaining a few of the elements of psychodynamic theory on personality. And I'll specifically focus on defense mechanisms and personality assessments. So now let's focus on defense mechanisms. A psychodynamic psychologist would explain a defense mechanism as an unconscious mental strategy that the ego uses to reduce anxiety and protect a person from distressing thoughts or emotions. Defense mechanisms help individuals cope with internal conflicts or difficult feelings or external stressors by distorting or avoiding reality in some way. There are multiple defense mechanisms that you need to be familiar with, and they're listed in the blue note at the bottom of the screen, and I'll explain each one of them with an example. The first is denial. Denial is refusing to accept reality because it's too painful to acknowledge. An example might be if a smoker is using denial, they might insist that smoking isn't harmful despite clear evidence. The second defense mechanism is displacement. This is when you displace something or you move it off of one thing and onto another. So in the case of defense mechanisms and coping with unwanted or distressing emotions, displacement refers to redirecting emotions from their original source to a less threatening source. So an example might be after a stressful day at work, a parent might displace the frustrations from their boss or maybe a difficult colleague onto their family by yelling at their children when they get home instead of addressing the frustrations in their workplace. The next defense mechanism is projection. And projection occurs when someone attributes their own unacceptable feelings as someone else's feelings. So an example would be if a person is feeling insecure about their abilities, they would be projecting if they accuse others of being insecure or incompetent. 
or if a partner is cheating and they feel guilty about their disloyalty, they would be projecting if they turn that discomfort onto their partner and accuse them of being unfaithful. Next is rationalization. And rationalization is a defense mechanism that occurs when someone justifies their own behaviors or feelings with some other seemingly logical reason instead of acknowledging the true cause. So when someone doesn't get a job, they might justify that by saying, I didn't really want the job anyway, instead of acknowledging their disappointment or considering that they may need to improve their interview skills. And these just allow them to protect their self-esteem or their self-image and avoid the uncomfortable truth of reality. The next defense mechanism is called reaction formation. And this occurs when someone acts in a way that is opposite of their true feelings. So if someone strongly dislikes their coworker, but instead of showing it, they act overly friendly and complimentary toward them, it could be a way of unconsciously covering up their true feelings. This defense mechanism helps reduce the anxiety or guilt that they feel about their negative emotions by portraying the opposite emotion. Another defense mechanism is called regression. And regression occurs when a person deals with a difficult or stressful situation by regressing or reverting back to a childlike state. So if an adult doesn't get their way and then they throw a temper tantrum, or if a middle schooler is having social anxiety and then starts to suck their thumb, these would be examples of people reverting back to childlike behaviors. The next defense mechanism is called repression. And repression is pushing distressing thoughts or memories out of conscious awareness. Sometimes I have seen it written as banishing these thoughts out of your conscious awareness. But essentially, something is distressing and your mind has pushed it away out of your consciousness. So an example might be if a person has experienced a traumatic event, uh, that child may no longer have a memory of that event, but maybe still reacts in fear in similar situations, but they've repressed that painful memory. The final defense mechanism is called sublimation. And sublimation is when someone channels an unacceptable impulse into something more socially acceptable. So if someone has aggressive tendencies, these aren't typically thought of as socially acceptable behaviors, but they might instead channel that aggression into something a little bit more acceptable, like participating in boxing or becoming a combat soldier. This would be sublimation. And these are the defense mechanisms that you need to be familiar with. So another important part of personality research is how the researchers identify the patterns of personality. And this is done through assessment tools. And depending on your approach, you might use a different type of assessment tool. Psychodynamic psychologists use projective tests to study personality. And projective tests present the subject with ambiguous or unclear images or situations, and they ask the subject to interpret them. And the goal is to tap into their unconscious thoughts or feelings that they might be repressing. There are no answer sets, but rather the subject just shares what comes to mind. And the tests are called projective because it's believed that the participant is projecting aspects of their personality or their unconscious mind onto the ambiguous image. Psychotherapists analyze responses looking for patterns that might reveal deeper psychological um, concepts or dynamics, things like emotional conflicts or anxieties or personality traits. The Rorschach inkblot test is an example of a projective test, and it was created by Swiss psychologist Hermann Rorschach in 1921. And it involves showing a subject a series of inkblot images like the one you can see on the screen and asking them to describe what they see and why. It's important to note, though, that Rorschach tests have been criticized for being um, unreliable in their results due to the varying interpretations that psychotherapists have when and looking at the responses. Another type of projective test used by psychodynamic psychologists to assess personality is called the thematic apperception test or the TAT. And this is a projective psychological test that was developed in the 1930s, and it involves showing participants a series of ambiguous images, usually depicting various situations and different characters in those situations, and then asking the participants to tell a story about what's happening in that particular image. The idea is that the person will project their own emotions 
desires and conflicts onto the characters and into the situations in the image. And this then would reveal aspects of their unconscious mind. Psychotherapists analyze themes, characters, and emotions that are expressed in the stories to gain insight into the person's psychological state, their motivations, and their interpersonal dynamics. Like the Rorschach test, the TAT has been critiqued for its subjectivity in its interpretation, but it's still used in some psychological assessments today. So this brings us to the end of today's video. Let's do a few short questions for review. Remember, I'll read the question out loud and you'll need to pause the video to determine the answer. Question number one says, which of the following best describes the term pre-conscious? Question number two says, Emma has been feeling stressed about her relationship with her parents, but whenever she is around them, she acts overly cheerful and affectionate. Which defense mechanism is Emma likely using? Question number three says, Tom's friend is constantly gossiping about others, but Tom defends their behavior saying, everyone talks about others sometimes. What defense mechanism is Tom demonstrating? This concludes today's video lesson on the psychodynamic theory of personality. On the left-hand side of the screen, you can check your answers to the review multiple choice questions. And on the right-hand side of the screen, you can go through and double check that you've taken away the most important parts of today's video.